Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Monaghan from Loughborough University. Uh, I'm today going to give a short presentation, short video abstract on some work we've recently done in the Howard Journal of Criminal Justice on experts and expertise uh, in UK drugs policy making. Uh, this paper uh, soon to be published in a uh, an edited collection, a special collection of papers on interpreting penal policy making, uh, started life um, with a question. Uh, we were wondering why um, in recent years the UK government seems to be soliciting advice from a broader range of um, a broader range of, through a broader range of instruments than has traditionally been the case. Um, and with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Emma Winkup and Dr. Kate Wicker from the University of Leeds, we sought to try and extrapolate why it might be that the, the tried and tested path in which evidence is considered, at least in UK drugs policy, seems to be changing in recent years. And we did this um, through a case study approach, taking two recent developments in the area of drugs policy, the uh, the, the the passing of the the 2016 Psychoactive Substances Act, and a recent review into um, social security social security benefits and whether these could be withheld from people with drug, alcohol, or weight related problems. This is known as the Black Review. So we looked at the origins of these two developments um, and how they seem to be contrasting with the ideal type of the way that evidence is, is harnessed in UK drugs policy. Now up until recent times, um, the government has, has tended to consider evidence from the, the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs in its formulation of drugs policy. And this was kind of considered to be the ideal type since the 1971 Misuse of Drugs Act was passed which created the Advisory Council, amongst other things, there's been a, an instrument there where the government would consider, at least, the advice of its scientific advisors in the development of drug policy in the UK. But over recent years, we've seen a kind of breakdown in this kind of relationship, starting probably with the, um, the furore over cannabis classification in the last, in the last decade, and it's to and fro in between classes B and C in the Misuse of Drugs Act. But this has happened more frequently, more recently, most obviously, I guess, and disappointingly with the, um, the government refusing to listen to the evidence from its advisors on the most evidence-based ways to reduce the record levels of drug-related deaths that we're currently experiencing in the UK. And so what has been happening recently are these new mechanisms, as I mentioned, that are being used to, to try and gather evidence uh, in the policy making process within UK drugs policy. So the question was therefore, are there new experts that are finding their way into the decision making process? And this is what we look to explore in, in the article. Um, and as I mentioned, we did this through, through two case studies approach, uh, two case study approaches, the, the, the passing of the, not, uh, the Psychoactive Substances Act and the Black Review into Social Security. And what we did was we gathered um, all the documentation we could find that was in the public domain uh, in these two areas, looking at the types of evidence and expertise that were used. We looked at the way that the policies were framed themselves and we looked at the kind of inclusion uh, and exclusion criteria for who would get their voice heard, at least in the consultation part of the, the policy process, if not in the delivery of it. And in the article, what, what we suggest is that even though there seems to be these new mechanisms by which, um, by which potentially other voices can be heard in the, in the decision-making process in UK drugs policy, what seems to be happening is actually it's the same voices that receive um, prominence. Uh, and this is partly to do with the way that, that the, the issues are framed in themselves, particularly this was 
the case in the in the Psychoactive Substances Act, where the final policy decision that was made was a, was a blanket ban, um, as as is been widely documented. But this was heavily influenced by the way that that the that the evidence was kind of was was kind of gathered in the, in the process. In the case of the Psychoactive Substances Act, instead of consulting the ACMD on the best way to deal with the emerging problem of of new psychoactive substances or legal highs as they were known. The government at the time uh, set up uh, an expert panel, an independent expert panel. Now there was some overlap in the membership of the ACMD and the expert panel, but it's clear from looking at the way that the panel was comprised, that it was heavily influenced by law enforcement, that these findings, the finding of the blanket ban amongst a whole range of other potential regulatory strategies, was not really any surprise bearing in mind that the way that the that the panel was was developed. So our article looks at the way that expertise is harnessed in the in the policy making process in UK drugs policy. But what it finds is even though the relationship between the ACMD and the government is strained, uh, the alternative mechanisms are still a fairly narrow uh, narrow perspective. Um, on the potential different voices that could be included in consultations around UK drugs policy. And one of the, the key constituents, the key stakeholders that are cons consistently missing from um, discussions around UK drugs policy are drug users themselves. Uh, and even though these new mechanisms seem to be more widely used, the same voices seem to be heard and also the same voices seem to be excluded and this is what we explore in our contribution to the, um, to the uh, interpreting penal policy uh, collection.